Well, I'm excited to be joined by Muhammad Ibrahim, a native Egyptian who grew up in the shadows of the pyramids. He's also a renowned Egyptologist, a soon-to-be author, and a famous tour guide who's actually going to be hosting our Megalithic Marvels of Egypt tour this May. Muhammad, thank you so much for joining me today. You're welcome, Dean. It's always a pleasure to uh, to join your show. Isn't there also um, pottery and vessels that actually show what looks like pyramids, again, that are come from people that were supposed to ex exist before the pyramids? Exactly. We have what we call it Nakada uh, pottery. Uh, Nakada is a, is a culture uh, between uh, 5,000 and 3,000. And it has like three phases, Nakada one, Nakada two, Nakada three. Nakada is north of Luxor, existed in, a, in a, an area not far from Luxor. And uh, till now, the funny thing that till now, this area is famous with pottery jars. The finest pottery you can buy from Egypt is from Nakada. And there are hundreds of uh, jars, not just one or two or 10, hundreds of uh, uh, vases and, and uh, jar uh, vessels, uh, pottery vessels, are showing series of pyramids, but yes, they are not triangles because I was in this debate many times with different groups. The first group was saying, these are mountains. Like so many of these jars, they, we can see crocodiles, uh, hippopotamus, ostrich, okay? And uh, by the way, sometimes giraffes. So they claim that the ancient Egyptian, the, the Nakada person, so uh, the, the surroundings of his environment, so these animals, uh, so trees, so he made this art. His art was based on what he uh, was viewing. I say, okay, uh, giraffe here is a, is a big question. They're supposed to not see any giraffes because giraffes used to live in Egypt when Egypt was green land. That stopped before 9,000 BC, okay? Uh, also, hippos are far away. Yes, they used to exist in Egypt, but at the southern borders. But my point is that they claim that these uh, triangle shapes are mountains. Egypt is flat surface. Yes, we have series of mountains, but uh, the Red Sea on the very far east of Egypt and in Sinai. And we talk about a man from Nakada, from South Egypt. No such mountains. We have high grounds or what we can call it uh, mountains, but with flat top, okay? Uh, you never see pointed top to these mountains. It's a, like very high ground, sometimes 700 meters above the ground, but all have a uh, flat uh, uh, top. It's like, that's why we call it the Nile Valley, high desert in both sides and the uh, low level of the valley in the middle. But we don't have these pointed uh, shapes. Uh, the, the second uh, group saying these are geometrical shapes. It's just about, he is, he, the man who made this loved the shape of uh, the triangle and he kept doing triangles, okay? Uh, that is like, can be considered, but why the, the man didn't make lots of circles and squares and other uh, geometric shapes? So it is very clear to me that these, uh, triangle shapes are pyramids. Not only these uh, pottery uh, jars, but there is uh, at the Nubian Museum, uh, we, uh, we have an ostrich egg. And you know that ostrich is, is, a, is a, a fragile object, okay? So it, it is not easy for someone to draw something on ostrich egg, okay? Unless that's, that's something very important from his point of view or her point of view. So in that ostrich egg, you see representation of three triangles, three pyramids, and some kind of wavy line on the uh, right side of these triangles. So if you look to the map of Egypt, you will find the Nile, okay, on the right side of the three pyramids of Giza. So another clear evidence that this egg also uh, dated to or attributed to Nakada time, uh, the man who made this drawing on that fragile uh, object was leaving this uh, picture 
or evidence for us about the existence of uh, Giza pyramids before uh, the fourth dynasty. That's so fascinating to me that we've got these clues of whether it's the stone vessel, vessels, vases, or these these uh, pictures on these pottery. Um, I want to talk to you now about megalithic statues. You referenced it earlier. This to me was one of the greatest surprises from our last tour was when you took us to the Ram Museum, which is this huge site down near Luxor. And it's dedicated to the great Ramses II, right, of the 19th dynasty. So he's one of these pre-dynastic Egyptians we're talking about to get the credit for building all this stuff. And this is a huge site. You see all the sandstone walls and pillars made in sections and the Ramses statues made in sections. But then you took us around the corner and you said, look at that. And there is this. It's it's badly damaged, but the remnants of a 1,000 ton statue made from a single piece of granite. The detail is so exquisite; you can see muscle tone on mm. the you know pieces of the body. And so you basically made the case to us: um, those statues there clearly were made by somebody different than this megalithic 1,000 ton statue. So um, talk to us a little bit about the megalithic statues of Egypt. And again, if you're watching by video, you're going to see the photos I'm going to add here that show the precision of these statues. But in short, Muhammad, do you believe that these statues actually depict the pre-dynastic rulers of Egypt? Ah, exactly. Look, you, you made a great point. This is very clear. When you visit these temples, you're going to see two things. You're going to see what I call it the dynastic work, dynastic um, great work, if I can call it this way. And you will see what I call it the dynastic uh, or the, the impossible work for dynasties. The two examples are in front of each other. So many people get uh, got confused when they uh, see both of them because they don't understand uh, the story. The first group of these people, they think everything supposed to be done, everything huge supposed to be done by advanced technology. The second group is saying, no, uh, everything was done by primitive technology, but lots of talent and patience. Okay, both groups are wrong. The, I say the first group who is attributing everything to uh, high technology, no. We shall not underestimate dynasties. They developed. When we talk about the 19th dynasty, we talk about development for more than 2,000 years. If we compare between dynasty one and dynasty 19, we talk about almost 2,000 years. So they must have been developed in a great way. Techniques and talent, uh, knowledge about the stones, how to hack the stone, how to cut, how to shape, what kind of tools, even if, uh, if we talk about primitive tools, okay? Uh, when the second group underestimating everything and saying, no, everything was done by talent, no. There are challenges cannot be covered or overcome with talent. No, it must be a precise, advanced tool, especially when we talk about granite. Look, we can talk much about limestone uh, things, okay? You, you will find me easy uh, when I talk about it, and I will not take any uh, uh, strong uh, action or, like, let's say, strong opinion, okay? Because it, limestone is not such hard material, and it can be shaped, okay? Uh, although I still don't agree that they can cut giant pieces of uh, limestone like we see at uh, the Valley Timbin of uh, the second pyramid at Giza. Also, these blocks must have been cut by uh, high technology, okay? Uh, but let's say that any kind of uh, life-size statue or even bigger from limestone or sandstone, it can be done, maybe quartzite. Okay, but when we talk about granite, when you talk about uh, alabaster, no, that is completely different story. 
granite on MOHS scale, M-O-H-S scale of solidness, it's six and seven, okay? So we need a kind of a, of a tool to go through this hard material. So if we talk about copper chisel, that is insane, okay? And many people are saying it is impossible to cut granite with copper. No, it is not impossible, by the way. There are some techniques can lead to this, but this is a lifetime work. If you try to use these uh, materials, uh, bronze, copper, even iron, by the way, okay? We talk about massive size of stone. We talk about 500 ton, 700 ton, 1,000 ton. But not just the size, we talk about also precision. We talk about perfect uh, symmetrical uh, statue or obelisk, okay? As if they, they ask the, the, the workers to make impossible work. If you look to the obelisk and you measure, if you like create a central line from the top to the base, the right side is exactly the same uh, the shape of the left side. Although that the, the obelisk starts as wide base and it tapers to the top and it leads to more hard work, okay? Uh, the details of the statues, the, the face, the nose, uh, the lips, uh, inside the ear. And uh, I hope you remember the statue we saw at the hotel. Uh, there was a, a modern uh, artist did some nice carving and he was selling these carvings. So we saw one of the statues and we looked to the ear. He made the ear in a very poor style. And I'm not saying he was bad artist. No, he was a very good artist, but that is the maximum of the tool, the maximum effect of the tool he is using. There is no other tool can do something like the ancient uh, Egyptian uh, uh, statues. So when you compare between the ear uh, of a statue was made in modern days and the ear of a statue was made in ancient days, completely different shape. The, the high quality exists on that ancient uh, head or ancient ear, okay? So not only high technology, but the, what I call it a uh, uh, funny and interesting thing in the same time, that there was also nanotechnology. We are not only talking about big machines, big blades, but we are also talking about small drills, like the dentist uh, drill, uh, small uh, uh, disc blades, okay, in order to uh, show the details, the tiny details of the uh, uh, inner uh, sides of the eye, uh, of the uh, ear, uh, the nose, the lips, okay, and uh, when it comes to showing that the muscles uh, of the, the chest and the, uh, the arms, uh, the legs. There is a statue at the uh, Egyptian Museum of Cairo, the, the old one, a uh, statue for a person called uh, uh, Amun Hotep, son of Habu. You look to perfect uh, statue with all the anatomies all the details of the muscles, even the knee and the uh, the, the toes, uh, the, 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 the abdomen, the shoulders, they were shown in great way, okay? So in a big scale or a small scale. So no way to claim that these uh, statues were made by uh, primitive tools, that that is unfair, okay? As if we are uh, saying that uh, the uh, ancient Egyptians uh, had uh, magical solutions. Uh, and we talk not only about a certain era, but you will find this great work uh, of granite objects started from at the early beginning of uh, the Egyptian civilization till the end. And, and I'm saying this because they attribute all these objects to dynastic work. So you'll find some work uh, uh, attributed to the first dynasty, second, third, fourth, to uh, dynasty, uh, 12, 10, and uh, 11, dynasty 18, 19, which is not correct because later I can show you some other examples. I'm very sure that it were made by, it was made by dynastic Egyptians and it was made in a very good way. And I can call it high quality, but it's still not super quality. 
you can see that it was made by great talent. But when it comes to tiny details, they make it quickly. They make it like as if, uh, like, again, I, I will go back to that statue of uh, son of Habu. When you look to the, between the toes, you will see the each toe is like 3D modern. They cut all the way down. But when you see another statue next to uh, that statue called the statue of Ramses II, they slightly made the, 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 that level deeper because they were afraid of breaking the two. Why? Because the first uh, group, the, the people who made the first statue, they had the efficient tool. The other group, they had hammers and chisels. And that's why they were afraid uh, to break the, the tool. So they make it they, they, as if they give us uh, the idea that this is the shape of the two. Okay, so that is a clear example to compare between the two styles. Incredible. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you bring up the geology. Again, if the dynastic Egyptians had copper chisels and hammers, which the archaeological record says they did, how would they precision craft harder material, granite, which is like a six or seven on the Mohs scale with 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 material that's a three or four on the most scale in copper. So another question about it, it just it's mind blowing to me that again you go to Egypt, you see these megalithic precision statues. The the 1000 ton statue at the Ram Museum, you can see part of its headdress. So these original, original ancient Egyptians had this look, you know, with the headdresses. The point is the dynastic Egyptians eons later are trying to look like them with still wearing the the pharaoh headdress type look and then i wanted to ask you that 1000 ton statue has these what i call deep embedded 3d precision symbols on its shoulders and then at the base of that statue there was these symbols that look literally like they were laser cut almost into granite precision and you read um what it said to us, I think it was said, you know, Ramses, son of the sun, chosen by the sun. My question is, is that, are these deep embedded symbols actually part of the original language of these megalithic builders? And did the Egyptians of the dynastic Egyptians take those and incorporate them into the, their modern language? Yes. Look, uh, of course, the, uh... These statues, we understand for sure that they belong to the uh, previous civilization, uh, advanced civilization. They had that shape of what we call it the shindit, the headdress. Uh, no, no, sorry, the nemes, the headdress, and the shindit is the 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 skirt, okay, and the position of the standing statue uh, and some of the very high quality writings. So yes, they uh, wanted to look like their ancestors. Like we do as modern Arabs now, you will find that the traditional uh, Arab dress or one of the, of the shapes of the traditional Arab dress is what we call it the galabeya. Yes, there are different styles, but we still do like them. That galabeya, uh, I think it started like at least 3000 years ago in, uh, in the, uh, Saudi or in, in the Arab land. So this is a way also to understand that uh, the, the advanced Egyptian civilization, and according to many uh, sources, and I believe uh, and I agree with the, this story, that the latest advanced civilization was destroyed at 10,500 BC by this solar disaster. But there was many survivors and those survivors managed to live under the ground. And when the effect of the disaster uh, ended and earth was uh, okay to live on, on the surface again, uh, and they started to move out of the caves, they wanted to, uh, or they had memories. Uh, they had some information, not from not themselves, from their parents or grandparents. Uh, about the, the shape of the life uh, before the disaster. So they wanted to copy or to imitate the style 
especially when they saw some of these uh, statues and maybe some of the carvings. So the, the, the spoken language was the same, and then the written language was made according to some of these uh, embed, embedded uh, carvings. Because you will see on some granite blocks, as you mentioned, uh, some of the ancient Egyptian writings were made in super quality. So no way again to claim that it, were, it was made by uh, uh, hand tools. No, when you touch it, you'll find the very fine smooth edges, uh, surfaces, which is no way to be done by hammers and chisels again. Okay, so yes, the dynastic Egyptians and maybe the pre-dynastic before them uh, wanted to act like the advanced ancestors. One last question for you. Um, so, you know, Chris Dunn and, and many others believe that uh, the Great Pyramid must have originally been built to provide a highly technical society with energy. And then the last time when we were talking, you shared how you believe the, you know, pyramids were somehow able to collect cosmic waves and that so when the dynastic Egyptians of 3000 BC show up, they're repurposing these pyramids, right? And I think you said that these pharaohs um, understood that the pyramid was like this ancient energy generator amongst many other functions. That's why they wanted to be buried inside of them uh, to receive the energy and to what they thought cross through portals. Can you tell us a little bit about your thoughts on the pyramids being energy devices and then the pharaohs coming along and repurposing them. Yes, I always use this example, which is not mine. It is an example of one of my friends. He's an electric engineer. He was talking about the same subject and he gave this example. He, he said, imagine any of these famous dams, water dams around the world, like the high dam in Egypt as an example. If you visit the high dam in Egypt now, if you just walk above the dam, it is like a bridge, okay? But if you go inside the dam, you will see huge machines, hydraulic machines producing energy. What if after 10,000 years, you come and visit the high dam and all these machines disappear? Just empty dam was built from concrete and uh, granite blocks. By the way, th there are so much granite on, on that day, okay? No way to convince you that this like uh, uh, solid uh, bridge or uh, water dam one day was producing energy because there is no single machine or uh, metal or wire because after 10,000 years, everything disappeared and eroded, okay? The same thing with the pyramids. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the pyramid is empty because all the devices disappeared. Not only the Great Pyramid, but all the other sites in Egypt. And then when it was reused, and that uh, new function is the latest function, and all the people in their memories still keep this uh, idea, so by time, this fun function started to stuck with the, uh, the site and people started to say this is the only function because there is nothing else is uh, giving different uh, opinion. Unless you start studying the, 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 the shape and the design, okay? If it is a tomb, why three rooms? Why one under the ground, one in the middle, one in uh, the last uh, one third of the pyramid, because this is not a small design. Each one needs great work. So it is not easy for the king to come and say, no, I don't like this, uh, give me different design. No, it's not a, a modern building. They can change the design. No. Uh, number two, the, when they made sure that this building was built in a certain place, and that will lead us to the story of Orion Pilt again. I was telling, uh, or I still tell all my groups that the location of the second pyramid, in the opinion of, uh, or from the construction point of view, 
is a big mistake. Any company of construction will never choose the location of the second permit because of the ground sloping angle. So it is completely wrong place. They, they must move a little bit to the west side when it is flat ground. But because the location is important and it is pointing to one of the stars, okay, to complete the, the shape of the alignment, it was a must to be built at that place. So that is a second great challenge, maybe bigger challenge than building the pyramid itself. They had to level uh, the ground uh, and to cut all the, the uh, stones from the west side, put it on the east side to create flat ground. Okay. So the uh, dynasties, in my opinion, they understood that these sites were producing kind of energy which was helping uh, people to heal. And, and I, I must tell you that till recent time, some local Egyptians in many sites in Egypt used to go to the ancient sites, especially temples, looking for a kind of material or an object or uh, some mud or some powder to use it in a local recipe for healing. So that was something was happening uh, till the last 20 years, maybe still happening, but in, in very limited cases now. But I can tell you 200 years ago, it was happening in a very large scale in uh, Egypt. Why that? Because the generations are passing the information that these sites were producing a kind of uh, healing energy. Okay. So according to Chris Dunn, uh, John Kederman, and so many others, that the, the, the pyramid, one of the functions of the pyramid was producing electricity. That's why the pyramid was used as a tool not because it is free uh, location, fancy location, no, because it is like a free ticket to the Pharaoh to come back or to go safe to the afterlife. You, you, under, you must understand that the ancient Egyptians were obsessed with the afterlife, okay? They understood that death is not the end. Actually, this is the beginning of a second eternal life. So they wanted to make sure to go to this life well prepared. I will tell you something very uh, strange. If you visit many of the uh, foreign cemeteries, um, um, especially England and uh, America, you'll find in the cemetery in some graves, they replace the tombstone with an obelisk. Okay, you go to the grave and I always give this uh, funny uh, example. In the movie Rocky, I think Rocky three or Rocky four, when his wife died. You see in the movie, he is visiting the, the tomb of his wife. I think her name was Susan or something, I don't remember. And you see with the wide screen, some of the graves was an obelisk uh, uh, shape or obelisk design. Why, why they put an obelisk? It is not related to Christianity or Islamic religion or anything like this. So why these people, uh, and that started from Coptic Egypt, okay? So why they put the obelisk instead of the tombstone? Because the same thing, the obelisk, one of the main functions of the obelisk is to absorb negative energies. So as if those people in modern days, or not very modern, but let's say the last 100 years, wanted to provide a way uh, to uh, absorb negative energies from the grave of their relatives. So instead of the tombstone, they put the obelisk, okay? So this is the way that unfortunately the, the dynasties understood the function of these sites better than we do nowadays. Well, Mohammed, thanks so much again for your time. And I look forward to seeing you this May on our Egypt tour. Yeah, me too. I can't wait to start this great tour. <laughs>